Hi everybody and welcome back. In today's video, we're gonna cover the high histamine food triggers that you may need to avoid if you have histamine intolerance, mast cell disease, or quite possibly even IBS. Stay tuned, we're gonna cover all this and more. Now, if you've been Googling the low histamine diet or histamine intolerance, the temptation at this point might just be to Google a low histamine food list or a high histamine food list. Google that, find those bad foods, and then avoid those bad foods, right? Bada bing, bada boom, no more histamine but that's not so much how it works in the body. What I'm gonna urge you to think of instead is that you have a histamine pool in your body and there are multiple ways that you can get more histamine in that pool. And when the pool overflows or when the bucket overflows, that's when you get these histamine intolerant or mast cell symptoms. And for some of you, you're starting out with a pool that's already totally overflowing with histamine and you need to kind of mop that up first and foremost. And for some of you, you're right at the tip top. And for some of you, this is not going to be a thing at all. But think about that total histamine pool. And then you can almost think of it like hoses coming into the pool. And then one by one, we can discuss each of those hoses and how you can mitigate the flow so that your pool is no longer overflowing. So the first of those hoses is going to be through your food. I don't think this is the most significant for everybody for the record, but this is going to be where those high histamine food lists come in really handy. So you may notice that there's a lot of fermented foods or you know, like preserved foods, aged foods, like aged cheeses, things like vinegar and tomato sauce. These are going to be things on those high histamine food lists that could, in the right person, cross the gut barrier, get through, and then ultimately contribute to that histamine pool that you have in your body, that if you're watching this video, there is some likelihood that it is building up and that's part of what's causing your symptoms. So yes, food is a contributing factor. Now, rather than like list out all of the foods, I'm gonna do one better and I'll give to you guys a PDF. So if you click a link in the doobly-doo down below, I'm going to link a PDF where I go through the high histamine food list that I use with my patients and an antihistamine food list. You can get both of those emailed to you. Just let me know where to send it and I'm happy to send that over, but that will break it down in more depth and then you know which foods are relatively higher or lower in histamine. So yes, food is one contributing pool. Another one that I don't think we have a great deal of understanding about, but we need to, is microbes. This could be yeast, bacteria, maybe even the viruses in our guts or parasites or methanogens, who knows. But if you have any degree of dysbiosis or leaky gut or candida overgrowth or SIBO, there is some likelihood that you could have a histamine burden coming directly from your microbes. And again, similarly, those microbes, some of them can make histamine. And then if that gets through, that can contribute to the histamine pool. I think what's even more important though, and maybe is overlooked, like a lot of people, to kind of get on a soapbox, a lot of people want to look at their GI map or their Genova stool test, and they want to Google and try to figure out, oh, is that particular bacteria making histamine? And I don't know if we truly know the answer to that consistently at this point in time. We have some understanding that some bacteria do make histamine. We also know that some bacteria gobble up histamine. So it could be that one microbe is making histamine and that others are gobbling it up, and maybe your histamine intolerance is less to do with an overgrowth of one bacteria, and maybe it has more to do with a deficiency in another type of bacteria. But that's a whole video for another day. Rather, I'm just gonna say here, microbes slash, oh, that's a very ugly D, there we go. Dysbiosis. Any sort of dysbiotic condition could theoretically contribute to this histamine pool. But there's another way. Not only are the microbes potentially making some histamine in and of themselves, and that histamine can directly get absorbed and contribute to your histamine pool, but more importantly, microbes are going to activate receptors on immune cells called toll-like receptors. Typically, that's what we're talking about at least. And then those receptors on immune cells, including mast cells, will trigger those immune cells to become more active. In the case of mast cells, it's gonna trigger them usually to degranulate. And what happens when they degranulate? All of these little granules of histamine and leukotrienes and inflammatory stuff gets spewed out into the surrounding tissue. In this case, perhaps the gut or the skin, and then bada bing, bada boom, the person has diarrhea 
or hives or migraines or whatever the symptomology might be. So in this case, I think that the dysbiosis and the microbes contributing to mast cell irritation and mast cell degranulation is a much, much bigger deal. And we probably oftentimes are getting too lost in the woods of like trying to Google which microbe actually makes histamine and which ones do not. I think just treating the dysbiosis for the sake of that not causing leaky gut so that then your food histamine is getting through, right? Because that's a whole nother angle. If you have a gut that's, you know, cinched together like this and everything is nice and tight and it's a nice little wall that's keeping you separate from your food, then you could eat all the food derived histamine you want and it's probably not going to get through. But if some of your cells are like this and there's a big gap, now you get a lot more of that histamine coming through. So on one day, you might be relatively more tolerant to your histamine burden as opposed to another day. And this is where, you know, again, we can kind of zoom out and see the context for this histamine thing and how complicated it can be. Yes, you could Google high histamine foods and you could avoid those foods, say tomatoes. Or you could also look and see, all right, any food that can cause leaky gut can now become a histamine trigger because not only is that going to allow the histamine in the food to get through more adequately, it's also gonna allow microbes and their toxins and their components to get through more readily and then make the mast cells freak out. So now we're looking at things like high saturated fat diets consistently across the literature. Yes, this includes coconut oil in excess. High saturated fat meals will consistently cause leaky gut syndrome. Alcohol will consistently cause leaky gut syndrome and it is a mast cell degranulator. Even things like for somebody like me who has autoimmune disease, even things like gluten and dairy across the board can be a mast cell degranulator or an inflammatory trigger via this leaky gut thing. So yeah, if you look at the low histamine food lists, they say that fresh cheeses are okay and hard cheeses are not for histamine content purposes. But what if you're like me and you can't tolerate dairy at all and any speck of dairy protein is gonna instigate leaky gut and piss off your immune system. Well, now this is where the line between the usefulness and the unusefulness of those lists can be a little bit more confusing. So food, I would argue, let's see, this is getting complicated now. So food can also directly impact not only the histamine pool, but also the mast cells and how irritated they are. And then finally, the last little bit that I wanted to touch on is that yes, we've largely talked about histamine content in food, but please know also that there are foods that are consistently shown to be mast cell releasers or mast cell degranulators. So things like, for example, um, you know, like some foods contain actual histamine, like meat and seafood if it's not fresh, that contains actual histamine, like the molecule itself. Other foods, say like, I believe citrus fruits and pineapple, um, a lot of tropical fruits as a matter of fact, and even things like egg whites, they might not necessarily contain histamine, the molecule itself, but they are mast cell irritants or degranulators for a lot of people. And then there's some likelihood that those foods will trigger your mast cells to go a bit bonkers. So that's the thing too, is like, there's, there's actually a really great video. It's on YouTube. It's Chris Masterjohn. It's one of his Chris Masterjohn light videos where he talks about a research paper where they try to look at the data about what foods do and do not contain histamine. And he basically brings up the point that it's very confusing and very inconsistent. And I think that part of the difficulty with this is that a lot of lists that you see on the internet, including my own, blend together this idea of foods that contain histamine and foods that are mast cell degranulators and trigger the immune system to release its own histamine. And the two of them can get a little bit muddied, especially since some people are probably going to be more vulnerable to one thing versus the other. So I would say those are your big, big things to focus on. If you're trying to genuinely lower your histamine load through your food, you want to possibly avoid the highest histamine foods Again, tomato sauce, vinegar, um, you know, citrus fruits, pineapple, fermented and aged, like anything like that, any sort of preserved food typically is gonna be higher in histamine. 
You want to make sure that you're keeping your microbes super happy and super balanced, and you want to make sure that you're feeding the good microbes and ensuring that they are healthy because ultimately they're going to keep the leaky gut from happening and they're going to keep your mast cells much more happy. You can also look to things that would cause leaky gut syndrome like fast food, processed food, trans fats, high saturated fat, and particular food allergens, sensitivities or allergies for you as an individual. I know for me, I'm, I, I react horribly to gluten and dairy both. So those are my two big triggers for me. And then finally, we can think of things that are mast cell degranulators, and those are going to be the things that don't necessarily contain histamine, but they, for whatever reason, irritate the heck out of mast cells consistently in a lot of people, and they also have some propensity to causing these symptoms. And you may discover as you go through, and you're on this healing journey, you may discover that you're really sensitive in a histamine way to foods that cause leaky gut, but maybe the high histamine foods actually don't trigger a lot of symptoms for you. Or you might discover that you can handle some high histamine foods in the winter, but when it's spring, when it's pollen season, you can't even look cross-eyed at a tomato without getting hives. So keep in mind that this is not like a, okay, I figured it out and I'm done scenario. You can play with this. You can see which one of these is contributing more to your situation and you can make progress. And a lot of my patients do in fact recover from histamine intolerance. It's just a matter of teasing apart all of these avenues and figuring out what works for you, what doesn't, and then what we need to do to get you to a point where histamine is no longer something you have to worry about. But I hope that this was helpful. Like I said, if you go to the link in the doobly-doo down below, I'm gonna put a link and you can go ahead and get a copy of the high histamine food list and the antihistamine food list. And those are PDFs that I use with my patients in my clinic. So you can go ahead and use those. And I hope that that gives you more of an understanding of how to do this squirrely antihistamine diet. It can be really therapeutic and really helpful for some people. And I hope that this video reaches the right people. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.